This video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. In 1959, The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis premiered on CBS. It was a sitcom about the clean-cut and all-around lackluster titular teenager who unsuccessfully strived to attain high school popularity, money, and the attention of women. The show lasted four seasons and featured a loose cast of recurring characters like Thalia, the pretty rich girl. I think a person's appearance is very important, don't you? Zelda, the brilliant academic. You can't beat science. And Dobie's best friend, Maynard, played by a pre-Gilligan's Island Bob Denver who's a lanky stoner type that says the word like at the start of every sentence. Like hi, like thanks, like no, like negative, like on, like never, like goodbye. A decade later, when CBS was on the hunt for a new animated series to follow The Archie Show, they reached out to Hanna-Barbera Productions and CBS exec Fred Silverman to create a cartoon about teens who solve supernatural mysteries. I uh, had always thought that kids in a haunted house would be a big hit. I think there was a great opportunity to do that, you know, played for laughs in, uh, in animation. Writers Joe Ruby and Ken Spears, along with artist Iwayo Takamoto, lifted the archetypes almost verbatim from the characters in Dobie Gillis to create Velma, Shaggy, Daphne, and Fred. They also added a dog sidekick named Too Much, but he wasn't a significant part of the show initially. That was until the series, which was then going to be called Who's S -S -S Scared, was thought by producers to be too intensely frightening for the child audience. Probably because the creators were also told to pull inspiration from the universal horror monsters, which, you know, are a little spooky. I can see where they miscalculated. We can't put that on the air. That's just too frightening. So I said, well, I gotta find a way to fix this damn thing. And I got a, I booked a red eye to go back to California. I, I couldn't sleep. You know, there's a red eye and I'm listening to music. And as we're going in for the landing, I, Frank Sinatra comes on and, and, and I hear him say, Scooby Dooby Doo. Strangers in the night. We're exchanging glances. Scooby Dooby Doo. -doo. <laughs> And it's at that point I said, yeah, that's it. We'll take the dog, we'll call it Scooby-Doo and move him up front and it'll be the dog show. And it worked. It just worked great. I was convinced this was going to be the biggest hit that we ever had, even though nobody knew what the hell it was. And on Saturday, September 13th, 1969, a cold and empty world was forever brightened by the premiere of Scooby-Doo, Where Are You? giving birth to a franchise that has been at constant war with itself for over 50 years. I love you, Raggy. Like, zoink, scoob, old buddy, old pal. You're the best friend a guy can ask for. <laughs> oh, how you doing, you wonderful nerds? Scott here, you know that YouTuber who's bald with the beard, you're familiar. So I'm stuck at home for the time being and my guess is you are too. So I figured I should probably make a video. Gotta at least pretend I care about appeasing the YouTube algorithm. Or I could just slack off and avoid the encroaching darkness with something light like a children's horror cartoon. Algorithm be darned. All right, where is that remote? Sparto, get out of here, man. I wanna watch a dog solve crimes with his four human pets. I think that remote is around here some. Like, zoinks, man. Ghost. <laughs> Well, gang, looks like we've got a mystery on our hands. Ugh. Well, while I'm here. So come along, it's mystery time. You can help us solve the crime. Well, since that ghost out there has me trapped in my beach-themed bathroom that I'm sure has excellent audio quality, let's analyze some Scoob. 
Because no, I mean, no one else is gonna. But first, speaking of beach themed stuff, this video inexplicably got a sponsor. Mm -hmm. And that sponsor is Surfshark VPN. Like surf's up, eh, Scoob? Yeah, surf's up. Now, you probably already know that VPNs can keep your web browsing secure and even block ads, malware, and tracking. Pages will load faster and use less data, and you'll finally stop being chased around by that dang cyber ghost. But the best reason to use a VPN, in my opinion, is the ability to use the internet in restrictive countries and to access content that's only available in countries outside of the one that you're physically in. Did you know that Scooby-Doo 2 Monsters Unleashed is not available to stream on the American Netflix, but is available in all of these other countries? Well, thanks to Surfshark, I can change my location to Canada, and now I can watch Matthew Lillard live his best life every single day. He's a shaggy oh. scoop quaking the whole city shaking. Or I could watch... Uh, Velma and Daphne. You know, I'm in the mood for something that will remind me how empty and sad the world is. Canada, why are these your only two options for Scoob content? Maybe you should also use Surfshark to escape to a land with more... Scoob on the tube, hated that. Uh, if you use my link in the description, you can get an 85% discount and three extra months for free of Surfshark VPN. If you use the promo code Zoinks, uh, because I thought that would be a very funny thing to do. Thank you to Surfshark VPN for sponsoring this video and making sure that the next time you surf the web, you're not scared off by a seaweed monster who's, who's just, it's just red herring. That's the end of our special report. Scooby-Doo is a franchise that seems to undermine itself with every new installment. When the first cartoon featuring the meddling kids and the goodest Dane came out, an essential crux of the show was that the monsters weren't real. Behind every ghost and ghoul was nothing supernatural at all, just elaborate trickery and phony costumes worn by greedy real estate frauds, art thieves, smugglers, bank executives, and other people who just want attention. Of course, sometimes villains just wanted simple shiny treasure. Treasures? Always with the treasure. Treasures? How much treasure? Treasures! There's so much treasure! In this way, the show touted a very pro-science message to question the supernatural. As Dobie Gillis's teacher once aggressively shouted, There is nothing, nothing in this world that exists without a scientific reason. There is an explanation, a logical explanation for everything. In other words, there's no such thing as a ghost. Sometimes these logical explanations are stretched by cartoon logic, where villains have access to highly advanced animatronics, element blasting weapons, and the ability to fly, but you get the point. There's a non-paranormal explanation behind the seemingly paranormal. Historian, philosopher, and literary critic Zvetan Todorov wrote about these kinds of supernatural stories where from the outside things look magical and inexplicable, but the mystery can always be unraveled rationally. In works that belong to this genre, events are related which may be readily accounted for by the laws of reason, but which are, in one way or another, incredible, extraordinary, shocking, singular, disturbing, or unexpected. If the reader decides that the laws of reality remain intact and permit an explanation of the phenomena described, we say that world belongs to the uncanny. The legitimacy of seemingly supernatural events can be eroded away by a few explanations. The first is, everything weird that occurred was actually imaginary. Dreams or hallucinations caused by madness, drugs, or other mind-altering circumstances can conjure up the appearance of paranormal events where none exist. Like the Mystery Solvers Club, or Scooby in Wonderland, or in Scooby-Doo and Kiss Rock and Roll Mystery, where the Crimson Witch's hallucinogenic gas takes the gang on an incredible mind journey to the universe, Kiss Hysteria, because the writers knew that that was the exact combo of words and sounds that would tickle me every time I said it out loud. Which is a lot. I say it every day to, and just to anyone who will listen to me talk about this. Basically, the explanation behind mysterious events is that nothing supernatural actually happened because nothing happened. No ghosts, no ghouls. You simply imagined it. 
But the far more common explanation in Scooby-Doo is that these mysterious events do indeed occur, but they aren't paranormal. They can always be explained away as planned tricks and prearranged illusions. That ghost doesn't fly. It's a hologram projection, or it uses magnetic repelling shoes, or an intricate system of pulleys and wires. The only paranormal thing is the localized wormholes somehow always located in hallways full of doors. But you might also think that some of this technology in Scooby-Doo, like anti-gravity boots, nearly sentient toys, and computers that transport living people into video games, seem more magical than anything that could fit into the rational, grounded genre of the uncanny. I mean, these are inventions that we don't have in our real world. Advanced technology is supernatural in its own way. But Tadarov argues that if the technology is explained away as something that reasonably exists in the narrative's universe, then it's not supernatural, even if it's foreign to our reality. Here, the supernatural is explained in a rational manner, but according to laws which contemporary science does not acknowledge. Like in Scooby-Doo 2, Monsters Unleashed. The greatest movie ever filmed that only Canada gets to see for some reason. The monsters are technically real, but they're made in a scientific manner, even if the process involves fictional elements like randomonium. It's not about paranormal events being explained away as ordinary or realistic in terms of our world. It doesn't have to represent our world at all. Instead, an explanation of supernatural events simply has to seem real and believable within the world of the story, or verisimilitudinous, if you want a pretentious SAT word to impress all your friends once you get to see him again. But that's what makes these stories fall into the category of the uncanny. In each episode, paranormal activity seems to break the character's understanding of reality. And each week, the gang chases down and unmasks these creatures to uncover time and time again that the problems in the world aren't otherworldly. Instead, the problem is wholly and easily explained as selfishness and the desire for more and more money or treasure that's as insatiable as Shaggy and Scooby's appetites. Something something capitalism, you know where I stand on this. And at the end of each tale in a formulaic tried and true denouement, the gang would unmask some basic white man who would curse those meddling kids in their mangy mutt. Rinse and repeat. Which is also good advice for the time that we're living through. I sure hope this bit ages poorly. My point is that Scooby-Doo built its entire franchise on the consistent theme that seemingly supernatural threats were always, always, always revealed to be nothing more than mere masked menaces and convoluted contraptions. This is the Scooby-Doo that I fell in love with. The shows that focused heavily on finding clues and solving a good old-fashioned whodunit, usually through lots of gaslighting. Like a welcome to Oli and Lars Speedy's massage parlor. <laughs> How'd you do, sir? How'd you do? Step right in, please. We represent Bouncy Baby, the baby clothesline. Step right in, sir. Huh? No waiting. I know, just a light trim, sir. We're all wearing it a bit longer these days. What? We're gonna be here a while. There's a ghost outside and I wanna check on my animal friends. This is a, look, he's like an, ac he's an animal actually crossing. That was really good timing. Jinkies. Now, we could talk about classic Scooby-Doo Where Are You as a shining example of this formula, but I want to highlight a pup named Scooby-Doo instead because I really love it. It's a series that ran during the early 90s and attempted to reboot the teen sleuths as younger child sleuths. It has, in my opinion, the best music of any Scooby show, and it's also the first time the gang was said to be from the town of Coolsville, so I'm endlessly grateful for that piece of lore. The people of Coolsville are the best in the world! It was definitely a more kid-centered Scoob tune, that's short for Scooby-Doo cartoon, but it also had strong elements of detective work. The gang would search for evidence, which was always easy to spot because a normally quiet and introspective Velma would say jinkies whenever a critical detail would come on screen. Jinkies! <laughs> essential clues in the story were made apparent, even if you didn't know how they exactly fit into the larger plot yet. And at the end of each episode, there would be a rundown of all the suspects and their motives, going so far as to rewind the story to examine the clues in context so you could have one final chance to solve the puzzle yourself. 
I mean, this cartoon was a proper detective show for children. They even had a character literally named Red Herring, who would always be accused of the crime, but never actually did it. Except for the one time that he did. I knew it! I knew it! <laughs> I knew it! I knew it! <laughs> you know what I like about this game? I've not played any of the previous Animal Crossing games, but I get the impression that this one takes a lot of what the previous games did and just kind of freshens up that aesthetic for a modern era. That's right, this entire Animal Crossing bit has been an extremely clunky way for me to say, I want to talk about what's new Scooby-Doo. What's this? For me? <laughs> oh boy! What's New Scooby-Doo is almost like a remaster of the original show. Take the timeless characters and formula of Scooby-Doo Where Are You and give it a very early 2000s makeover. Cut the laugh track, make Simple Plan do the theme song, and update the costuming to make the gang a little more hip. I mean, just look at Shaggy's stunning redesign. Wow, what a transformation. But they kept the most important element from the original cartoon by letting it stand as a detective-focused Scooby series. In fact, for the show's final season, WB Kids aired new episodes, but cut it off right before unmasking the villain. You'd be left in suspense each week as the show encouraged readers to think through the evidence, go online, and vote on who they believe the culprit is. Their dramatic conclusion to the mystery would air the following week, right before the next new episode. And I loved this. It gave viewers time to ponder the evidence, to look over the suspects and motives, and to use critical thinking to solve the puzzle, which is exactly what I should be doing right now. I can't be cowering in the bathroom while some ghost haunts what my landlord insists on calling an apartment. No, I need to think. It's probably not a real ghost, right? Like, I'm imagining things. Or, it's a person in a costume trying to scare me away for some reason. Probably not money related though. Like the only reason I can afford to watch Scooby-Doo right now is because I finally suckered my bosses, the Super Carling Brothers, into paying for a Boomerang subscription by telling them that it was a research expense. Which I guess is true now, dang it! That ghost made me honest, I can't stand for that. That's it. I'm gonna unmask this creep right. Sparta, has it been you clawing at the door this whole time? Are you desperate for that much attention, man? Knock it off. You see, I knew there was no ghost. I must have just made it up in my head. The old noggin's just playing tricks on itself. No ghost here. Uh, which means I can probably go back to watching cartoons instead of making this video. The script isn't even particularly good, to be honest with you. Like, it says right here I'm supposed to scream and say, Jeepers, the ghost seems to be real. Okay, so, um... Jeepers, the ghost seems to be real, but whatever. It's the least of my concerns right now because now I'm trapped in my bedroom, which I'm sure has even worse audio quality and nothing of visual interest because my preferred bedroom aesthetic is a boundless blank void. Do you think the, the ghost out there would let me borrow some of those uh, colorful lights that it's using to kind of enhance the- Perfect. Yes, I feel something sinister brewing, which is good. Because so far we've only been discussing about half of the Scooby-Doo franchise, and this eerie mood lighting is the ideal space to dissect the other half, mingling in between each of the stories I've talked about so far lies variations on the iconic Scooby formula. Stories that turned make-believe monsters into authentic horrors. This time, Scooby, the ghosts and ghouls are real. 
13 Ghosts of Scooby-Doo, Scooby-Doo and the Ghoul School, Zombie Island, Alien Invaders, The Witch's Ghost, the first theatrical live-action film that doesn't nearly live up to the utter genius of its successor that should be studied in film school for generations. All of these Scooby stories and more feature supernatural monsters that don't have rational scientific explanations. Unlike the genre of the uncanny, where the common understanding of the world doesn't need to change, the introduction of genuine creepy creatures and otherworldly powers means, on the contrary, new laws of nature must be entertained to account for the phenomena. Now, as Todorov writes, we enter the genre of the marvelous. Stories in the marvelous genre end with an acceptance of the supernatural. The very fact that it remains unexplained, unrationalized, suggests the existence of the supernatural. In my effort to be comprehensive, we now have the unfortunate task of acknowledging the existence of the 13 ghosts of Scooby-Doo. Or I could just let that ghost outside eat me or whatever it wants to do. I don't this show is perhaps the most notorious cartoon that plants Scooby-Doo into the center of the marvelous, fighting the paranormal. In the first episode, Shaggy and Scooby unwittingly open the chest of demons, unleashing, as the title suggests, 13 ghosts. It's up to them and the rest of the gang to chase down the demons and seal them back into the chest, uh, I guess for fear that they might take over the world. They mostly just kind of goof off. Let's go on little, little silly romps. Like, one of them just kind of has a dinner party. You know, I, just, I don't think that's a very high priority. Like, it's not the end of the world if we don't catch that one, is what I'm saying. Yeah, it's a hard show to watch, and anyone who tells you otherwise is lying for a reason I haven't figured out yet. The only redeeming quality is Vincent Van Gogh, who is very fun with his campy horror puns and the stellar, charismatic voice acting of Vincent Price. I must check my horoscope. But it doesn't matter because the show also has Flim Flam. Now, I know that people tend to hate on Scrappy Doo with a passion, and I get it, but he's a non entity in this show. He has like maybe two lines every episode. Flim Flam, on the other hand, Flim Flam is the worst. No dice, eh? Then here's my final offer. <laughs> Don't hurt me, please. I beg of you, I'll do anything. He's like this every episode. I can't, I, why do people like that? This show is just relentlessly noisy. It's an unforgiving scattershot of colors and sounds that genuinely makes me uneasy. But there are glimpses of good in what can generously be called the show's writing. One of the most intense episodes is It's a Wonderful Scoob, where after eight battles with monsters and demons, Scooby-Doo's mind finally snaps. No, no, no more, no more, no more. No more what, Scoob? No more ghosts and monsters. My grand stranded, my fat enough. In a brutally gut-wrenching and honest scene, Scoob vows to quit hunting the supernatural and live a quiet life as a regular dog because that's what he needs right now. Dealing with paranormal threats is just too much stress, too much anxiety for an innocent doggo. When I watched this episode for the first time, it broke my heart. But I was uh, swiftly taken out of the moment because the captions on Boomerang can't even spell bananas correctly. It's not a one-off thing. It happens every single time someone says the word bananas. Or should I say, bananas? Bananas? Really? Why is every aspect of this show so terrible? Little tip from me to you, Scoob. Spell check. It's a magical tool. That's how I get through all my scripts. Whoops. Spelled every word wrong. <sighs> Again. Wait, wait. Magical tool. That's... Maybe that's what I need to beat this ghost. If it is a real monster, then perhaps I can only defeat it with some kind of mystically powerful weapon. But all I have is this hammer from a land known as Ikea. Yeah, that could work. Oh, hey, look, more actual content. Scooby-Doo on Zombie Island is probably the outing that most immediately comes to mind when you think of the gang facing off against real terrors. It's widely held as probably the best animated Scoob move. That's short for Scooby-Doo movie. 
Oh, I should have said Scoob V. That's a much better portmanteau than Scoob. Pretend I said Scoob V. I don't know what editing is. <laughs> the gang goes to a haunted mansion on a secluded island to unravel centuries of mysterious disappearances. The first half of the movie features bickering among the gang, as Daphne is destined to prove that there are real monsters out there in the world. Velma and Fred, however, are insistent that it's always been people in masks, and it always will be. It's just guys in masks, and they're probably after the pirate's treasure. Or covering up a smuggling operation. Can't you accept that maybe there are some mysteries that have no rational explanation? Shaggy and Scooby are, um, they're doing their own thing. They chase leads and destroy property, and the time comes where they're finally ready to unmask the baddies. But these aren't masks. They aren't animatronics. It's not smoke and mirrors. The zombies are simply zombies. By the end of the film, the gang learns to fully believe in monsters, witches, and magic rituals as part of reality alongside Daphne who was proven right. They use voodoo dolls to defeat cat demons, and Velma casually accepts the nature of ghosts and curses as if it's just a feature of reality now. Because it is. Like, what's happening to them? Their spirits have been avenged, Shaggy, so they can finally rest in peace. There's no such thing as a ghost. Fred, Daphne, Velma, Shaggy, and Scooby all leave the island without any evidence to prove to the outside world that these mystical forces genuinely exist. They have to now live their lives with knowledge they can't share because... Who would believe them? Which is why I'm glad I got this ghost that's been chasing me on camera. Now all I have to do is not break any- Oh, dang it! Okay, yeah, you know what? I'm, the production value around here is dropping rapidly at this point. I just kind of want to pack it in, stop making this video, and just go watch some cartoons. Yeah, I had a feeling. Hold the phone. Did that phantom seem scared to you? Why would a paranormal being be frightened by other paranormal stuff? Was it scared of potentially being defeated or was it a phony in a costume and the sight of real mystical powers made it panic? So far, we've been trying to separate all of Scoob Media into two camps. One where nothing supernatural happens, and another where at least some paranormal activity actually occurs. But what happens in this moment, this pause, this instant of uncertainty? We watch cartoons, finally. Yeah, Mystery Incorporated is one of the most beloved. Ben Corwin. Hey, boss man. Uh, why isn't the boomerang subscription working anymore? The cartoon thing? Yeah, you broke that down like a year ago as a research expense, but we really can't prove that to the tax people unless you make a video about Scooby-Doo like you promised. I'm working on a video right now. Kinda seems like you're lounging on the couch trying to watch cartoons. For research! Mystery Incorporated is one of the most beloved modern Scooby-Doo cartoons. It differentiated from classic Scooby-Doo by having an ongoing storyline running throughout its two seasons. While a typical episode would involve the gang capturing a monster and unmasking it as a greedy or disgruntled human person, threaded throughout the series was genuine arcane terror. 
The overarching plot involved nearly Lovecraftian existential horror elements that made Scooby and the gang break down and question their own reality. Look at the massive toll it took on Velma, the rational mind of the group who's forced to start believing in the irrational. That's it! I quit! I don't understand any of this! I have spent my whole life believing in facts, in clues, but we're in some dream world fighting a nightmare monster! It doesn't make sense! I want it to make sense! I need it to make sense! Mystery Inc. is not just a series. It's a love letter to Scooby-Doo, flip-flopping between logical explanations and supernatural elements, just like the entire franchise. And this is what makes Scooby-Doo so fascinating. You never know which way each new mystery could go, because there's precedent for both. This is what I mean when I say the Scooby-Doo franchise has been at war with itself for over 50 years. It's got this pattern of contradictions, a few outings of creeps in costumes followed by a stretch of real monsters, then back to masked menaces, so on and so forth. It's a duality, if you will. Either the devil is an illusion, an imaginary being, or else he really exists, precisely like other living beings. And this is the state that we find ourselves in with every new installment of Scoob. Which way will the pendulum swing? Toward the uncanny or the marvelous? Well, in this moment, the truth is uncertain. It's vague. It's fantastic, literally. For a story to be classified under the genres of the uncanny or marvelous, the audience has to definitively know one way or the other if the paranormal is real. It doesn't matter if the outcome is that a monster gets unmasked or a magic ritual has to break a curse. In either scenario, we know which end of the spectrum the story takes place in. But before we have all the answers, we're trapped in this middle ground of ambiguity that Todorov calls the fantastic. The fantastic is the hesitation experienced by a person who knows only the laws of nature, confronting an apparently supernatural event. Once we choose one answer or the other, we leave the fantastic for a neighboring genre, the uncanny or the marvelous. The fantastic occupies the duration of this uncertainty. That hesitation, your inability to confidently catalog the story as either the uncanny or the marvelous, that is what creates the fantastic. And it's in this space where the true wonder and excitement of Scooby-Doo comes out. We've been discussing the Scooby-Doo franchise as having individual outings that sit comfortably into either the marvelous or the uncanny. But the truth is, there's always a hint of uncertainty in every tale. Scooby-Doo and Guess Who had an episode with Sherlock Holmes. In-universe, the gang knows that Sherlock is a fictional character. Only the most famous detective in all literature. And the police just think that this guy is someone with a mental disorder masquerading as the fictional detective. Crackpot Sherlock, we calls him. Sherlock claims to be the real deal and offers explanations for how he's standing before the Hound of Coolsville and the rest of the gang. But the story ends vaguely. Are we supposed to believe that Holmes is real or not? The episode never forces the audience to lean one way or the other. Even Zombie Island and 13 Ghosts, two outings that fans thought were placed squarely in the genre of the marvelous, have been retconned by modern day movies to be more uncertain. In Return to Zombie Island, Velma claims that the previous events they experienced were probably just hallucinations of cat monsters and zombies brought about by... Swamp Gas. I think it's best to let her have this one, Fred. In The Curse of the Thirteenth Ghost, Shaggy, Scooby, and Daphne bring Fred and Velma along to reunite with Flim Flam and Vincent Van Gogh and not Scrappy to finally capture the Thirteenth Ghost that they never bothered to defeat during the original show 30 years prior. Yep, the Thirteen Ghosts of Scooby-Doo ended with Flim Flam vacuuming up only 12 ghosts, like some kind of low-budget Luigi. Yeah, I don't like this show. Not only did every single episode suffer from rushed animation errors, but the series itself ended with a gaping, unfinished chasm in its continuity. Although, 
To be fair, I, at some point during this video, I lost my watch and just kind of drew one on with the permanent marker, so I can't really give it that much grief. In the movie that attempted to resolve a 30-year cliffhanger, they left us with a new unsolved mystery. Did anything in the original cartoon actually happen? Are the 13 ghosts even real? Is Vincent Van Gogh an actual spellcaster, or is he a fraud? I mean, even his mystical artifacts like the crystal ball act more like technology than magic. Whenever it was broken, it showed static like a TV, and the gang would often fix it with a screwdriver or by hitting it like it's a printer. I told you to print double-sided! As always, Velma, who was not there in the initial show, continues to be the skeptic of the group and thinks up rational explanations for every strange event. Did Daphne, Shaggy, Scooby, the lesser Scooby, and the other one actually fight demons back in the day? Or was it all made up due to mass hallucinations from oxygen deprivation? I mean, it is the Himalayas. But the gang don't buy it. They know that they fought real monsters. So determined to convince everyone that this entire journey from the old TV show to the present day has all been fake, Velma threatens to reopen the chest of demons. If she's right and nothing supernatural has ever occurred, then all that will happen is she will anticlimactically open an empty box. But if Velma is wrong and the paranormal does genuinely exist, then she will be re-releasing the 13 ghosts that Shaggy, Daphne, and Scooby fought so hard to capture all those years ago. They will be once again free to roam the world, and they will have to capture them again. And who knows how long that will take? It took three decades of energy the first time. Do you know how many banners that is? But when Velma goes to open the chest of demons... Ugh, fine. They never open the chest? Are there any actual demons in there? Unconfirmed. We're just left hanging forever in ambiguity. And I love it. This is what the franchise is about. While particular Scooby shows seem to exist on one end or the other, the franchise as a whole lives and thrives in the fantastic. And this entire meta theme is encapsulated perfectly by one famous gag from the show. Think about all the players in the Mystery Inc. gang. Shaggy and Scooby are the ones who always believe the monsters are real in every incarnation. Daphne and Fred flip-flop throughout the franchise. Sometimes Fred believes in monsters. It was the mole people! Sometimes he believes in reason. It's just guys in masks! Sometimes Daphne fights demons. And sometimes she tells a ghost to its face that she doesn't believe in ghosts. I still don't believe there are such things as ghosts. But Velma is consistently the logical, scientific, rational one of the group. This is showcased not only in her personality, but also in her character design. She wears glasses, which represent lenses through which to see the world clearly. But when she loses her glasses in that iconic bit, Hey! My glasses! I can't see without them! Things become literally and figuratively unclear. In that moment, Velma represents the fantastic, the franchise's natural state. She can't see without her glasses, just as we can't see which direction each new installment of the franchise will go. Will the monsters be some greedy person in a funky costume? Or will the ghosts be real? Will the laws of their universe stay intact? Or will they need to be rewritten? We don't immediately know. We might never know. It can remain hazy and fuzzy, but that, that's what makes Scooby-Doo fantastic. Scooby -Doo. <laughs> In short, I love Scooby-Doo, not only for 
everything I rambled about for the past however long this video ends up being, but also because the show was surprisingly pro-teenager during a time where the youths were seen as a social disruption. We're the beat generation. From its roots as a mystery unraveling detective show and with the inclusion of superstition and fantasy later on in the series, the core of the show remained consistent. It's a group of young teens looking for truth and doing right in a complicated world. And it inspired its viewers to follow their example. From the very first theme song, which sets the tone for the series, we can notice how it differentiated itself. Other Hanna-Barbera cartoons would introduce the characters, Flintstones, meet the Flintstones, meet George Jetson, and set up the world a bit without asking too much more from the viewer. Yogi Bear is smarter than the average bear. But Scooby-Doo drags the audience into the story using phrases like, we need some help from you now, and we've got a mystery to solve, and I know we'll catch that villain. All the best theme songs from Scooby-Doo shows have this kind of audience inclusion. Okay, so admittedly the theme song to Mystery Incorporated doesn't have any lyrics, but if it did, I feel like it would say something like, Scott is correct here. This is a very good analysis. This is it, chief. No, that was really bad. Don't, don't put that in. My point is, Scooby-Doo has always insisted that we skip the pleasantries and get to work. Mysterious things are happening, and you as the viewer aren't allowed to just sit there, watch ghosts and ghouls run amok and think, well, that's that, I guess. Uh, monsters are real, and we just have to accept their place in our society now. No! These theme songs demanding that you help solve a mystery inherently implies that there is indeed something to get to the bottom of. It evokes skepticism and curiosity. When you see a ghost, the audience is trained to think, but, but is it really a ghost, though? And over the next half hour, you are going to get involved in the story and help unravel this mystery. And that's what I'm going to do right now. All right, come on out. I'm not scared of you anymore. I'm well, maybe a bit uneasy still, but I think I've gotten to the bottom of this mystery. I know under that cheap ghost costume is none other than Sparta. My cat. Yeah, that's right. You've been extra cuddly lately, haven't you? And all I've done is brush you aside, and I'm really sorry about that. But really, are you going to, to don a, a ghost costume and haunt me in some sort of petty revenge? No, obviously, because you're just real lazy and want to sleep all day. Okay, uh, somebody else, there's gotta be some other culprit. Yes, yes, the ghost only seems to attack when I threaten to watch cartoons and the people I tricked into paying for those cartoons would be rightfully upset by that, wouldn't they, Super Carlin Brothers? One second, um, hello? Hey Scott, it's Ben again. I heard you were in the middle of accusing us of breaking into your place and trying to scare you into making a video. But you know, there's all this COVID stuff going on right now and we're all practicing social distancing, which is the very reason we told you to work from home to begin with. That makes a lot of sense, actually. Plus, it sounds like you're actually making a video about Scooby-Doo. So this extremely boring tax subplot you've had going on is entirely squared away. Also, good work on that Surfshark ad. Okay, so there's um 
There's gotta be someone else. There's gotta be, uh, uh um, I think, 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 yes! The only true culprit it could ever possibly be. Oh, I'm on to you. Red herring! I'm so, I, I'm so sorry. I just, I keep getting, yeah? This is red herring. I just wanted to tell you I'm not even in the country this week. Right. So don't go blaming anything on me. Okay, so, um, does that mean, does that mean that this is really a ghost then? Cause I don't know if I'm prepared for if it's actually a ghost. Cause I don't, there's no such thing as ghosts. It's you. Of course, of course it's you. I've been haunted by you since I stopped making videos as frequently. You, you want me to get back to work. You saw this quarantine as a way for me to make new content and any time, any time I threaten to, to stop and, and relax and unwind, you attacked me, jinkies. Because you knew it would get me to go back to work. You are scaring me into being productive. It's your whole thing, isn't it? I'm trying to take my time and, and make stuff that I'm proud of, but you don't care. You just want content. I should have known. Monsters underneath are always greedy products of capitalism. Well, you got what you wanted. I made another super ambitious video that nearly killed me. But you know what? If all you want is content, then fine. We're gonna step away from comics and superheroes this year. I love those topics desperately, but I, I feel stuck a little bit. I wanna talk about other things that I'm interested in. I wanna talk about Studio Ghibli films or, or Dungeons and Dragons, Bob Ross, a bunch of other niche ideas that no one will watch videos on. It's gonna be a dry year. And you wanted this, but hopefully I'll have fun again. But wait, hold on. I, I swear earlier I heard some kind of ominous psychic voice in my head and, and and when i was waving the hammer around i really did summon some kind of mystic energy didn't i i mean you might be a just a thing in a costume but magic is real now in this universe isn't it i mean that's why you ran away all scared i didn't just make it all up in my head did i I've been stuck inside for a bit too long. Cabin fever setting in, probably, so it's probably what it is. Hey, you wanna dance? Grace! Like, let's rock and roll, Scooble, buddy old pal. <laughs> You're not fooling me, cause I can't see the world.
That one certainly hit hard, huh? Yeah.